Therefore, in order to keep the legitimate course in this matter, we must return to the Word of God, in which we are furnished with the right rule of understanding. For Scripture is the school of the Holy Spirit, in which, as nothing useful and necessary to be known has been omitted, so nothing is taught but what is of importance to know. Everything, therefore, delivered in Scripture on the subject of predestination, we must beware of keeping from the faithful, lest we seem either maliciously to deprive them of the blessing of God, or to accuse and scoff at the Spirit as having divulged what ought on any account to be suppressed. Let us, I say, allow the Christian to unlock his mind and ears to all the words of God, which are addressed to him, provided he do it with this moderation, viz. that whenever the Lord shuts his sacred mouth, he also desists from inquiry. The best rule of sobriety is not only in learning to follow wherever God leads, but also when he makes an end of teaching to cease also from wishing to be wise. The danger which they dread is not so great that we ought on account of it to turn away our minds from the oracles of God. There is a celebrated saying of Solomon, It is the glory of God to conceal a thing. Proverbs 25 verse 2 but since both piety and common sense dictate that this is not to be understood of everything, we must look for a distinction, lest under the pretense of modesty and sobriety we be satisfied with a brutish ignorance. This is clearly expressed by Moses in a few words. The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever. Deuteronomy 29 verse 29 we see how he exhorts the people to study the doctrine of the law in accordance with a heavenly decree, because God has been pleased to promulgate it, while he at the same time confines them within these boundaries for the simple reason that it is not lawful for men to pry into the secret things of God. Section 4. I admit that profane men lay hold of the subject of predestination to carp or cavil or snarl or scoff, but if their petulance frightens us, it will be necessary to conceal all the principal articles of faith, because they and their fellows leave scarcely one of them unassailed with blasphemy. A rebellious spirit will display itself no less insolently when it hears that there are three persons in the divine essence than when it hears that God, when he created man, foresaw everything that was to happen to him. Nor will they abstain from their jeers when told that little more than five thousand years have elapsed since the creation of the world. For they will ask, why did the power of God slumber so long in idleness? In short, nothing can be stated that they will not assail with derision. To quell their blasphemies, must we say nothing concerning the divinity of the Son and the Spirit? Must the creation of the world be passed over in silence? No! The truth of God is too powerful, both here and everywhere, to dread the slanders of the ungodly. As Augustine powerfully maintains in his treatise, De Bono Preservante, for we see that the false apostles were unable by defaming and accusing the true doctrine of Paul to make him ashamed of it. There is nothing in the allegation that the whole subject is fraught with danger to pious minds, as tending to destroy exhortation, shake faith, disturb and dispirit the heart. Augustine disguises not that on these grounds he was often charged with preaching the doctrine of predestination too freely, but as it was easy for him to do, he abundantly refutes the charge. As a great variety of absurd objections are here stated, we have thought it best to dispose of each one of them in its proper place. See chapter 23. Only I wish it to be received as a general rule that the secret things of God are not to be scrutinized, and that those which he has revealed are not to be overlooked lest we may, on the one hand, be chargeable with curiosity, and on the other with ingratitude. For it has been shrewdly observed by Augustine that we can safely follow scripture which walked softly, as with a mother's step, in accommodation to our weaknesses. Those, however, who are so cautious and timid that they would bury all mention of predestination in order that it may not trouble weak minds, with what colour, pray, will they cloak their arrogance when they indirectly charge God with a want of due consideration in not having foreseen a danger for which they imagine they prudently provide. Whoever therefore throws obloquy on the doctrine of predestination openly brings a charge against God as having inconsiderately allowed something to escape from him which is injurious to the church. Section 5. 
the predestination by which God adopts some to the hope of life and adjudges others to eternal death, no man who would be thought pious ventures simply to deny, but it is greatly cavailed at, especially by those who make prescience its cause. We, indeed, ascribe both prescience and predestination to God, but we say that it is absurd to make the latter subordinate to the former. See chapter 22, section 1. When we attribute prescience to God, we mean that all things always were and ever continue under his eye, that to his knowledge there is no past or future, but all things are present, and indeed so present that it is not merely the idea of them that is before him, as those objects are which we retain in our memory, but that he truly sees and contemplates them as actually under his immediate inspection. This prescience extends to the whole circuit of the world and to all creatures. By predestination, we mean the eternal decree of God, by which he determined with himself whatever he wished to happen with regard to every man. All are not created on equal terms, but some are preordained to eternal life, others to eternal damnation, and accordingly, as each has been created for one or other of those ends, we say that he has been predestinated to life or to death. This God has testified, not only in the case of single individuals, he has also given a specimen of it in the whole posterity of Abraham, to make it plain that the future condition of each nation lives entirely at his disposal. When the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. For the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. Deuteronomy chapter 32 verses 8 and 9. The separation is before the eyes of all, in the person of Abraham, as in a withered stock. One people is specially chosen, while the others are rejected. But the cause does not appear, except that Moses, to deprive posterity of any handle for glorying, tells them that their superiority was owing entirely to the free love of God. The cause of which he assigns for their deliverance is because he loved thy fathers, therefore he chose their seed after them. Deuteronomy 4 verse 37. Or more explicitly in another chapter. The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any people. For ye were the fewest of all people, but because the Lord loved you. Deuteronomy 7 verses 7 and 8. He repeatedly makes the same intimations. Behold the heaven and the heaven of heavens is the Lord's, thy God. The earth also, with all that therein is. Only the Lord had a delight in thy fathers to love them, and he chose their seed after them. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verses 14 and 15. Again, in another passage, holiness is enjoined upon them, because they have been chosen to be a peculiar people, while in another, love is declared to be the cause of their protection. Deuteronomy 23, verse 5. This too, believers with one voice proclaim, he shall choose our inheritance for us, the excellency of Jacob, whom he loved. Psalm 47, verse 4. The endowments with which God has adorned them, they all ascribe to gratuitous love, not only because they knew that they had not obtained them by any merit, but that not even was the holy patriarch endued with a virtue that could procure such distinguished honor for himself and his posterity. And the more completely to crush all pride, he upbraids them, with having merited nothing of the kind, seeing they were a rebellious and stiff-necked people. Deuteronomy 9, verse 6. Often also do the prophets remind the Jews of this election by way of disparagement and opprobrium, because they had shamefully revolted from it. Be this as it may, let those who would ascribe the election of God to human worth or merit come forward, when they see that one nation is preferred to all others, when they hear that it was no feeling of respect that induced God to show more favour to a small and ignoble body, nay, even to the wicked and rebellious, will they plead against him for having chosen to give such a manifestation of mercy? But neither will their obstreperous words hinder his work, nor will their invectives, like stones thrown against heaven, strike or hurt his righteousness. Nay, rather they will fall back on their own heads. To this principle of a free covenant, Moreover, the Israelites are recalled whenever thanks are to be returned to God, or their hopes of the future to be animated. The Lord, he is God, says the psalmist. 
It is he that has made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Psalm 100, verse 3. Psalm 95, verse 7. The negation which is added, not we ourselves, is not superfluous to teach us that God is not only the author of all the good qualities in which men excel, but that they originate in himself, there being nothing in them worthy of so much honour. In the following words also they are enjoined to rest satisfied with the mere good pleasure of God. O ye seed of Abraham his servant, ye children of Jacob his chosen. Psalm 105 verse 6. And after an enumeration of the continual mercies of God as fruits of election, the conclusion is that he acted thus kindly because he remembered his covenant.